Hello. Uh, it's hello. 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 Hello there. Welcome back to Space School. Look, today we're back with what would have happened had Mace Windu trained the Chosen One. Before we begin this video, special thanks to our patrons, voice actors, and everyone else part of my team. Want a chance to win a free lightsaber in the next giveaway? Watch the end of the video, and I'll tell you exactly how you can win. This is an excerpt from the private journals of Mace Windu from the Revenge of the Sith novelization. If the prophecies are true, if Anakin Skywalker is truly the Chosen One who will bring balance to the Force, then he is the most important being alive today. And he is alive today because my instincts were working just fine. Because my mistake on Geonosis wasn't a mistake at all. If I had done as Deba said I should have, if I had won the Clone War with a Baradayan bomb on Geonosis, I would have lost the real war, the Jedi's war. Anakin Skywalker may be the shatter point of our war against the jungle. If he is, if Anakin is the being born to win that war, it does not matter if every other Jedi in the galaxy dies. As long as Anakin lives, we have hope. No matter how dark it gets, or how lost our cause may seem, he is the new hope for a Jedi future. May the Force be with us all. Our story begins upon the Jedi Council's return to the Jedi Temple. When they returned, they gathered up. Yoda would inform the Council that he was going to allow Obi-Wan to teach young Skywalker. The Council was silent, for a moment. Mace Windu took a deep breath. He looked over and noticed that Master Yaddle wasn't present. Windu leaned back in his seat and rubbed his chin, before looking over to the seat next to him. He told Master Yoda that if they were going to allow someone to teach Skywalker, why not allow an established Master do so? While Windu had previously was against the idea of training Skywalker, he believed that if Skywalker were to be trained inside of the Jedi Order, then an established master should be the one to teach him. And since Yoda already made it apparent that Skywalker was going to be allowed within the Order, and trained within the Order, then maybe a council member should take on that training of Skywalker. Yoda looked at Windu and asked if he was suggesting that he would train Skywalker. Windu took half a second. It was one of those moments where one speaks before fully completing their thoughts, forming together that what they really wanted to say. Windu would respond resoundingly quick with a certain yes. When the words came out, he was shocked, but he followed it up with his own confidence, standing up and walking to the middle of the council. Mace knew he couldn't take back that statement now. He closed his eyes and looked at everyone after closing them telling them that he would take it upon himself to train Anakin Skywalker. Because if he was meant to be the Chosen One, if he was truly meant to bring balance to the Force, then he should be trained by one of the few Jedi Masters with an established balance that could master both light and dark. Mace was a Jedi who was able to master both of those in his own way, using Shatterpoint and Vapad to harness the dark side of the Force in a controlled manner without going overboard. Mace continued telling the Council that he would do his best to teach Skywalker. Maybe he didn't like the idea of it, but if it was the truth that Skywalker would bring balance to the Force, then it would be necessary to train Anakin. Firstly, Windu would have to discuss with the changing of Master Kenobi to Master Windu. He might not take it as well, so the best approach was to find him in a one-on-one -on -one situation. Eventually, after the Council dispersed, Mace would make his way down to talk to Obi-Wan Kenobi. Off the bat, Obi-Wan was very noticeably upset, but he didn't step up to Windu. He just listened to everything that Mace told him about the Council decision. Obi-Wan asked why the Council changed his mind. Mace expressed that the decision was his to teach Skywalker, to which he continued by saying that an established master must teach Anakin if he is to be the chosen one that it was necessary. Obi-Wan told Mace that he made a promise to his master, to which the Master of the Order would inform Obi-Wan that his promise was being fulfilled. It wasn't an insult to Obi-Wan, but he needed to be more time as a Jedi Knight before he could just jump into being a Jedi Master. Mace told Kenobi that he believed in him. He came from a strong lineage of Jedi Masters, being that it was Dooku, before Dooku was Yoda, and after Dooku was Qui-Gon, and then it was obviously Obi-Wan. Mace then informed Obi-Wan that he had pre-planned a Jedi for him to train. She was a young Togruta, she'd been in the temple for a couple of years thanks to Plo Koon. Mace told Obi-Wan that Ahsoka would be a great future apprentice for him. Obi-Wan asked if that would mean waiting nearly a decade for an apprentice, to which Mace would tell him it would be, depending on her own growth. Obi-Wan was genuinely taken aback by this. It was rather insulting to be told that he had to wait 10 years, at the very least, to become a teacher. Obi-Wan stood up for himself, telling Windu that he'd prefer 
to have the opportunity to train students sooner. Maybe not Anakin, but at the very least, have the given respect of someone who just killed a Sith. The first to do so in over a millennia. Windu paused. He told Obi-Wan to think about it, that he would think about it himself as well. He needed to discuss it with the council whenever it was able for him to get back up there and talk to them. Currently, the council was trying to figure out where the two Jedi Masters were, Dooku and Yaddle. Windu told Obi-Wan that he would find him in the coming weeks with the choice the council would give him. Mace would bow and leave, heading towards the youngling area of the temple, searching for Skywalker. Once he found him, he would tell young Skywalker that he would be his teacher. Anakin was immediately caught off guard, a little discouraged actually. He knew that Windu didn't want him inside the Jedi Order. Anakin's motivation to succeed was taken out of him, like the wind leaving his body. Windu informed young Skywalker that he would be down in the wing to check in on him during the coming weeks. Anakin nodded his head as Windu left the area. For Mace, he felt like this was a short productive encounter, straight to the point and allowing Skywalker to make his own decisions with the knowledge given to him. Mace would pick up the training of Skywalker after he figured out what happened to Yaddle and Dooku. Windu bowed to Anakin and then left the youngling area to come back up to where Yaddle was last seen inside the temple garden by Master Sanube. She was standing there in silence, moments before Dooku left, walking in the direction of the Great Hall. From there, he could have ended up anywhere. Mace walked through the corridor, searching, trying to figure out where the last frequency of Yaddle was found. In the communications room, Windu found that she was last tracked to the industrial sector of Coruscant. Her ship had last moved 20 minutes beforehand. Windu asked for the coordinates of the location so he could go in and check in on her. Assuming that her communications were down because she wasn't responding to any transmissions coming from the Jedi Temple, Windu left immediately in a Jedi Starfighter similar to the one that Dooku took when he abandoned the Jedi Temple. The Temple's hangar security noticed that one of the Starfighters had been missing, but all of its frequencies were turned off when it left the Temple. It was just simply gone and vanished in the thin air. When Windu reached the outer layer of the industrial sector, he landed inside of one of the buildings. Windu got out of his ship and wandered around, seeing Yaddle's vessel inside the building. He walked up to the ship and looked inside, after making sure that the coast was clear. On the inside of the vessel, he saw Yaddle. She was long dead. Her body had just begun to rot, and her head was already severed from her body. Mace looked at the body of Yaddle and then looked away, igniting his lightsaber. Windu called the Jedi Temple and told them that he found Yaddle, deceased, at his coordinates, suggesting that a couple of Temple Guards come out and take her body back to the Temple instead of a sarcophagus. Mace walked around the area for a little bit, with his amethyst blade illuminating the dark tomb of the industrial building. Dooku and Sidious planted the ship far away from their secret lair, so that the Jedi wouldn't find it. Luckily for them, Yaddle turned off her frequencies when she arrived at their lair, so the Jedi could not track her movements to the industrial sector, and just assumed that it was a frequency mistake that she had them turned off or that they just weren't working. Within 30 minutes or so, a group of temple guards arrived with a sarcophagus for Master Yaddle, and Depa Bilaba and Kiade Mundi arrived to search the area with Mace Windu. They searched for hours, but other than Yaddle and her vessel, it appeared as if no one had been present in this location for decades and maybe even centuries. The Jedi would return to their temple and hold a funeral for Master Yaddle. It would be very somber. She was a leading member of the Jedi Council and she was killed by someone in secrecy. Assuming she had reason to believe the Sith were on Coruscant, she traveled out there without the wisdom of the Council. Maybe the Jedi were looking into it and she was doing more of a traditional suicide and the frequency accidentally turned on inside of her ship. But that wouldn't make sense, especially since she stepped down from the High Council with little to no inclination as to why she did. The mystery of Master Yaddle's death would plague the Council Chambers for months. They would begin to heighten their awareness of the Sith for a short period of time, something that would come to an end within the short couple month period, coming to the conclusion that she had done it herself and she didn't want anyone to find her. The frequency was turned on by accident, by the will of the Force if you will. While the ignorance of the Council continued to plague the Jedi Temple, considering their lack of knowledge of the disappearance of Master Sifo-Dyas, the death of Master Yaddle, and, well, the disappearance of Count Dooku. Windu would eventually have to get back around to teaching Skywalker, which he would do, learning that Anakin had fallen behind. He seemed to have no light in his soul, he was being consistently bullied, and he seemed as if he didn't believe he could succeed. 
Windu didn't know what was going through Anakin's mind at the time. All he knew is that Skywalker seemed disconnected from his classes, either not paying attention or droning off, none of which was really true. He just didn't exactly get along with the teachers and they didn't like him for it. Simply, they decided they wanted to see him fail because he wasn't responding like everyone else was. When Mace went down to take Anakin away from his peers, he was modestly angry. He wasn't thrilled that Skywalker was already such an issue inside the temple. When he got there, he realized that someone was clearly lying, that someone not being his apprentice. Young Skywalker seemed disconnected, disassociated from everything. Windu asked for Skywalker to walk with him. Windu asked him why all of his teachers were saying that he was a bad student. Anakin was genuinely taken aback. He told his master that they weren't even giving him a chance, they just seemed like they wanted to see him fail. Windu wasn't sure if Anakin was lying or not, but he continued addressing Anakin as young Skywalker. Before Mace could squeeze out another question, Anakin asked Master Windu if he could be called Anakin instead of young Skywalker. Windu looked down at Anakin, and he was a little taken aback. He wasn't really sure to respond to that, so he just nodded his head. Windu then asked Anakin if he then wanted to be a Jedi. Anakin stopped in his tracks and looked at Windu, and thought for a moment. He told Windu that he did. He wanted to be someone who could help others. He saw the worst of the galaxy, and what the worst of the galaxy had to offer at Mos Espa, and he didn't want to have other people to experience that. Windu then asked why he was so reluctant to learn. Anakin sighed. He told Master Windu that he simply believed he was being set up to fail. Windu asked why, and Anakin expressed that not even Windu wanted him inside the Jedi Order. Why would he want to train someone he didn't believe was worthy of being a Jedi? If anything, between the teachers, the bullies, and the change of future master, it seemed like the Jedi were just trying to force Anakin out of the Order. Windu subtly gasped. He didn't realize how this all looked. He also didn't know that Anakin had bullies inside of his classes. Sure, he was the new kid on the block, and kids were, well, kids, but still, not very Jedi-like behavior. Windu placed his hand on Anakin's shoulder and guided him forward. He suggested that he had his skepticisms. Everyone did. The Jedi hadn't seen the Sith in a millennia, and since the death of Qui-Gon and the defeat of Maul at the hands of Kenobi, it didn't seem like the Sith were a real threat. Qui-Gon Jinn always had an imagination. He wasn't a traditional Jedi master, and most of the council thought that he was suggesting the unimaginable. On top of that, why would the Force produce the Chosen One without a time where the Force needed to be balanced? Windu admitted that maybe it was a failure of the Jedi to see this, so in retrospect their actions and decisions were wrong. Windu continued saying that being a Jedi didn't always make them right, and sometimes their over-reliance on the code allowed fallacy in their own actions. For which Mace apologized to Anakin. He apologized to Anakin for the actions he and the Council took before Qui-Gon's death, because Qui-Gon should have never died. Had Qui-Gon survived, maybe his friend Dooku wouldn't have disappeared, and maybe Yaddle may have not died. But a first lesson for Anakin would be not dwell on the past. Windu told Anakin that he'd be taking over Anakin's training from here on out, and there would be no inclusion of skeptical teachers, bullies, or even classmates. They would work one-on-one -on -one until Anakin felt confident enough to progress to each next level. Windu told Anakin that they would move at his pace, no matter how fast or how slow. Being that Anakin had such a high midichlorian count, the chances are that they would start off slow, and then it would slowly begin to speed up, unlike anything seen since before the time of Revan. Anakin still seemed a bit out of it, as if something wasn't clicking for him. Windu noticed this and took his young apprentice to one of the training rooms. Windu turned on the hardest programming from the practice drones, as 30 drones popped out of the walls and the floor. Mace didn't ignite his lightsaber. Three, two, one. The sequence began as blaster pellets began to shoot across the room. Windu moved around, ducking and weaving effortlessly between pellets flying through the air. Windu kicked up his left foot, smacking one of the droids into another. Windu rolled under a couple more pellets and then lunged forward using his fist to punch out several of the probe droids. Windu then flipped his lightsaber off of his belt and caught it in midair, igniting the amethyst weapon. Windu spun around using Form 7 to block and deflect pellets back, tearing through the probe droids. Anakin on the side of the room watched with his jaw on the floor, and Windu saw a glimpse from the corner of his eye. It made him smile. In a short moment between moves, Mace couldn't help but appreciate the awe coming from young Skywalker. He had the same moment when he was just a boy as well. Windu within a minute or so would finish off the last of the probe droids before turning to Skywalker and sheathing his lightsaber. Windu told Skywalker that he would teach him 
how to be capable of this, but only if Anakin wanted him to. The truth is, Anakin wanted to. He really did. And now he felt like there was the slightest chance of that being possible again. Windu would take Skywalker under his wing, and the two of them would be the most unsuspecting bond between Master and Apprentice ever. Windu and Skywalker would get along extremely well. It would take time, of course. Once Windu made it clear that he wanted to understand Anakin and listen to him, the two of them were able to bond. On the other hand, it benefited Anakin that Windu knew how to use the dark side without falling into it. This would be integral for Anakin's training, something that the two of them would focus on, and they would also focus on the Jedi Code. Mace was a practicer of the Code, and he studied it like his life depended on it. He knew the ins and outs of it, and it would be something that Anakin had to learn as well. Windu understood Anakin in a way that Obi-Wan was struggled with. Obi-Wan was still a little upset over what happened regarding his training of Skywalker, but he ended up taking another student a year and a half after Anakin began training with Windu. Anakin originally didn't like the studies of the Jedi Code. They were bland study sessions, but Windu was able to litter the study sessions with little tidbits to accumulate Anakin into liking it. Master Windu wasn't Master of the Order for no reason. Having trained two students, one of them being on the High Council at such a young age in her life, Windu was already clearly going to make Anakin a brilliant young Jedi. One thing Mace did that Anakin didn't expect was he didn't force Anakin to lose attachments. Does this mean that they went to Tatooine to free Shmi? No, not at all. Windu was able to configure Anakin's mind to believe that the will of the Force was how everything happened. It was something that Anakin was originally skeptical of. But Windu took Anakin down to downtown Coruscant, upper class society with biosustainable parks built into shopping malls and upper class outlets throughout the city. The Jedi infrequently went there, but they went down in disguise. Not really, just two robes. The two of them sat at a restaurant and Mace told Anakin to watch the people. They did this every week after study sessions. It was a break for both Windu and Anakin. They trained physically hard throughout the week and then so on the final day of training each week, they'd do studying for about four or five hours, understanding the code, and then they'd go downtown to get a high class meal whilst talking about the lessons they learned during the day. It was a great way for Anakin to engage in open discussion without feeling like he'd get blasted for questioning a certain rule. It took time for Windu to deduce that Skywalker would learn better through this means of study, but once it happened, it flowed really well. With both an open discussion about the Code and the Will of the Force, Anakin was able to see why and where his master was coming from on all of his beliefs. When Anakin challenged beliefs, he would receive a discussion, and he would be able to come to terms with why the Jedi did it, or express to his master that he didn't really see where he was coming from. Oddly enough, Anakin's challenging of the code allowed Windu to see some flaws within it, because not everything exactly made sense. Skywalker reminded Windu of Dooku a lot, but truth be told, Windu preferred Anakin because he was a lot less confrontational about it. Dooku went off the deep end and never looked back. Skywalker, on the other hand, was able to question it and see that something could be made from it. Somehow the Jedi Order could benefit from even the code that slighted the Jedi in a negative way. Anakin was really something unique. While in these public spaces, Windu would continue his lessons with the will of the Force, showing, for example, when someone dropped a drink, was it by accident or was it the will of the Force? Showing the interlocking of two lovers. Was it by mistake, or were they always destined to intertwine? Anakin was a bit slow to it, but it kind of made sense in a weird way. Because as Mace explained it, it was the will of the Force he was brought to the Jedi Temple, and it was the will of the Force that he was challenged in even believing that he was worthy of being inside the Jedi Temple. This thought process would be told to Anakin as he had free will, but the will of the Force guided him. It was always on his side, and it always wanted the best for him. Anakin, as the years would come and pass, would understand this more and more. As he got older, he believed the will of the Force would guide him in each of his next steps. In terms of physicality, Windu let Anakin get away with growing his hair out and allowing him to wear black robes. Windu believed that Anakin was a unique study as a student, so as talented as he was as a young man and his efforts to stand out, they were encouraged. As Windu taught Anakin, the two of them bonded in a way that Anakin and Qui-Gon would've. It was almost paternal in its nature. Windu and Anakin worked hard in lightsaber combat, and once Anakin started to mature, the two of them hit the Jedi Gym two times a week, slowly to three times and up to five times. 
Windu didn't show it under his robes, but it was very necessary, in his opinion, to be one with your body. It allowed complete spatial awareness and confidence in any given situation. Anakin agreed and picked up on it quickly. As for lightsaber training, Anakin struggled a little bit. It wasn't Anakin, it was more or less Mace. Windu didn't take it easy on his apprentice. As Windu put it, Anakin was going to be the baddest motherfucker the Order ever seen. When Anakin was 16, Windu let him off the leash, allowing Skywalker to do as he wanted as a Jedi Knight. Anakin didn't expect this. It certainly was very unexpected to him, but Windu believed that he was ready. Anakin and Mace agreed that every week they would come and continue to spar. Anakin wasn't yet at Mace's level, but because Mace trained Anakin at his own pace, he had far exceeded expectations. Anakin flashed through all of his training, he utilized the Force as well as just about anyone inside the Order. Though once Anakin was promoted the Jedi Knight, he asked his master to teach him on how to become a master. Mace was genuinely surprised. The irony of the two of them being surprised by each other in the same instance was a shining example of what their bond was really like. So Mace would take Anakin under his wing and teach him what it meant to be a Jedi Master and how to do so effectively. Mostly showing Anakin the same things he did with him, but in a more conservative approach, being that Anakin would most likely train a Jedi that was born and raised inside the Jedi Order. Reminding Anakin that not every student would be like him, because Anakin was a very special case, so always remember to take it slow if someone is struggling to keep up. Mace also told Anakin that he would be fine during this entire process. There was absolutely no reason for him to fret about being a Jedi Master, even at his age, which was 17. Windu would inform his former student that there was a young student ready to become a Padawan if he wanted to take a look at her potential. Anakin, of course, would take the opportunity. Thus far, he hadn't led him astray. Anakin also had a distinct benefit by being trained by Windu. He was greeted with the same respect that came by being a council member. This tended to happen when one was trained by a council member. In a way, it was like brown nosing inside the Jedi Temple. The hope was a student would put in a good word with the council members. Regardless, Anakin and Mace went to the Youngling training studio. She was the last one up of her group. She was very young, 12 at this point in her career, using similar programming that Mace had used, just in a lesser degree, of course, meant for a youngling. Anakin and Mace sat down at the beginning of the training, and she began to ignite her green lightsaber and moved around effortlessly, floating as if she was on a cloud. Anakin looked over at the instructor of the class and asked for her name. The instructor told Skywalker that her name was Mira Preman. Anakin nodded his head and looked over. She continued doing as such, cutting down the droids in a flawless fashion. When she was done, Anakin whispered to his master, suggesting that she would likely be the perfect student for him. Windu nodded his head and told Anakin he thought he'd like her. After some traditional ceremonies for graduating from Youngling the Padawan, the meeting of the Padawan and the Master, officially crowning the Master the title of New Master, and so forth, all things Anakin had never gone through having been trained exclusively by Mace Windu. It was a long and drawn out process, as most ceremonies are, and when Mira was Anakin's student, off the bat, Mira knew that Anakin was an unorthodox teacher. He was far from being orthodox, and she would be challenged in ways that she would never be challenged ever before, which she accepted with open arms. Anakin and Mira were two different individuals. Mira was born a Jedi, raised and taught all the same. Anakin was not, and so he felt responsible to keep his past away from her. He didn't want to worry her or even freak her out. Anakin had seen some crazy things on Mos Aspa, so off the bat, he took Mira to the same place he and Mace had been going for years. Why? Well, he needed to establish a middle ground, to know what she knew, and to know what she didn't, and how he could teach her the best that she needed. Unlike her, Anakin was never taught Form 1 lightsaber combat, and said he was taught Form 7 and moved backwards, which inevitably meant he was, but he wasn't taught Form 1 first. He didn't know all of them, but he knew them enough that he could be an effective guide at teaching them. He needed to know what Mira was looking to become, and how he could help guide her in those steps. When the new master and apprentice landed in downtown Coruscant, they went to the same outlet area that he and Mace went to. Anakin would ask all the questions he could, to which he could learn anything or everything he could about his new student. Mira was advanced enough to understand Form 1, and she was really pretty decent with the Force. Though one answer she had completely stumped him, Mira wanted to become a temple guard. 
That's what she was truly passionate about. She loved the Jedi Order, and it would mean the galaxy to her if she could just keep those inside the Jedi Temple safe. Anakin took this information in and informed her that he would do everything he could within his power to ensure that she could commit herself to the secret world of the Temple Guards. Anakin would make a personal note to himself to make sure that he went to Syndralic when they returned to the Temple. After Anakin's quick interrogation of his student, he would turn to her and ask if she would look out and see what she saw and tell him what she saw. Mira was a bit confused, but she did as her master asked, and she looked back and said, the word people with a question behind it. Anakin smiled and turned back and told her to look again. He said to her, while she watched the crowd of people walking back and forth, he said it was the will of the Force. Mira smiled. Anakin saw the excitement from learning shine in her eyes. It was a magical moment to Anakin. In this moment, he could see himself training hundreds of students, maybe even thousands. Sure, not entirely feasible for a human, but still, the feeling he got from seeing her enlightenment made him realize why one taught. Anakin would continue to explain things that May saw, that he now felt, to her. When they returned to the temple, Anakin told her to head to her new quarters, and he would grab her in the morning. Training would be difficult, and would push her to her limits. Mirror nodded her head with a smile, expecting her master to say this. Not realizing the world of pain, her master was going to put her through. Anakin had a nice thorough talk with Syndralic before getting all the information he wanted about how to teach Mira. Syndralic was also kind enough to lend Anakin a double-bladed lightsaber, considering he couldn't just hand Mira a temple guard pike. Syndralic also gave Anakin a mask, not the same Temple Guard mask, but one that was similar enough so that Mira could get comfortable having something covering her face while in combat. Anakin was very appreciative and then asked if there was anything else. Syndralic didn't give out any extra information. What he gave was enough to keep it fair for all members of the Jedi Order who wanted to eventually become Temple Guards. In the morning, early morning, Anakin woke Mira up before most of the temple was even awake. It was 3 in the morning, Coruscant time. Anakin told her that she needed to be ready. If she was a temple guard and the Sith or someone had bad intentions to cause harm on the temple, she needed to be ready. Mira popped up and stumbled around gathering her belongings, before slamming into the door trying to follow Anakin out of her room. He turned around and helped her up. She had a very noticeable bruise on her face. She really plowed into the door hinge on the way out. Anakin told her that she'd be alright. Mira agreed. She was still waking up, and the adrenaline of being woken up from her sleep in such an unexpected time in the morning made the pain fade away. Anakin took her down to the training facility and got her started. He also, when she was training, got her some back to patches for that little bruise on her face. Anakin joked with her that he wouldn't hit her again, to which she jabbed back telling him that the wall would hit harder than he ever could. Anakin bursted out laughing. This is what their relationship was going to be like. Okay, he could live with that, snippy little Padawan. He preferred someone that didn't take shit, and rather dish it back out. It would strengthen their bond with one another. Anakin would continue this difficult training, slowly weaning her on to using the Pike-style lightsaber. When she got comfortable enough to not cut her arms off, Anakin would make her train with the helmet Sinjali gave her. Because of Anakin's freakishly timed training sessions, Mira's sleep schedule was thrown into disarray. Because of that, she took naps throughout the day. Sometimes Anakin would let her nap, other times he would scare the soul from her body and put her in a high alert and get her into the training arena. When he woke her up, she loathed him, but she really did appreciate it. She knew what he was doing for her was to make her the best of the temple guards, if not the best, one of the best. Anakin saw the value in her, and he wanted her to see the value in herself. Two years into her training, Anakin would be taking her off-world. Routinely he would do this because sometimes he would have to go off-world, and so would a temple guard. Very rare occasions for temple guards to leave the temple, but the lessons she would learn being off-world would be useful in any given situation, whether it was Jedi diplomacy or simply holding down a situation and keeping it from escalating, for example, a protest or a riot. The Jedi were the keepers of peace in the galaxy, and all seemed right. Mira was approaching 15 and Anakin was 19, and then everything turned on its head. An assassination attempt on one of the most important senators in the Republic, Senator Amidala, was a part of the peaceful coalition side of the Senate, and she was trying to beat back the military creation bill. Palpatine wanted her away from the Senate so that he could certify the bill and begin a proxy war. It was certainly a plan made by the Sith Lord, but it wouldn't pan out as he hoped. 
Anakin and Mira would be brought back to Coruscant to guard her. Mira was super excited about this because she was finally able to do some protection work. Anakin was relatively excited, but he kind of forgot about Padme. It's not that he didn't still find her attractive or lose his ability to harbor attachments, he just had more important things in his life at the point. He was a teacher, he had a student, and he had responsibilities. It wasn't worth it, not in the slightest. Anakin was focused on himself, he took his job very seriously, and as did Miro, so when Padme had another attempt on her life, the two Jedi acted very quickly. Except instead of lip being out the window, Miro whipped her lightsaber out the window, cutting the droid down and then using the force to pull it back into the room. Anakin made sure the senator was alright, as Miro examined the droid. Anakin turned back around and examined it with her. They would take it back to the Jedi Temple for further investigation. Because the Jedi were able to recover the probe, Padme was even more encouraged to stay on Coruscant. Anakin, being a Jedi Master, agreed with her position inside the Senate, and while a Jedi, he couldn't be influenced by the Senate, he believed that it would be better if she stayed on planet. And so, with Padme, the Jedi Master, who was heading the security team, deciding that she should stay, she was allowed to stay. For Palpatine, this would disrupt his plans. On the other side of things, Mace Windu would be able to figure out that the probe was from Geonosis, supplied by a Mandalorian on a rain-filled world in the Outer Rim. How did he figure this out? Because of an old friend named Quinlan Voss who was able to use a force to do so. With the information Mace Windu gathered, he would give it to the Council. There was a lot at play here, and they needed to be discreet. They didn't serve the Senate, but having an assassination attempt on a public official was certainly a problem. Yoda would send himself out to a few water worlds in the galaxy, starting with Mon Calamari. Mace would take Quinlan Voss, AC-10, and Eeth Koth to Genesis. At the same time, Master Kenobi and his apprentice would be sent to Mandalore to see if they could find any traces of Mandalorian hunters that attempted to kill Padme. Over the next two days, events would transpire, several of them actually. Yoda would be directed from Mon Calamari to Kamino, a planet where they about a decade before traded several underwater metals too. Mon Calamari was a big trader of underwater materials that were high functioning. Kamino bought enough for a couple facility platforms. Most of what they bought were simply pillars to hold up the platforms. Yoda went to Kamino and discovered a clone army. On the other hand, Obi-Wan and his student encountered Duchess Satine, who reported that there were no issues loose on Mandalore. The Death Watch was still forming and they didn't have a lot of warriors. Satine also didn't know about these warriors, so Kenobi's trail ran cold at an old friend who he did adore. On the other hand, Padme was able to place her vote against a military creation bill, something Jar Jar Binks wouldn't have done, because Jar Jar is the key to everything. Because of this, it would block Palpatine, and it took away the force behind his support. Most of the supporters saw the fallacy in his strength, being that they couldn't simply just gather together a simple military creation act to combat the Trade Federation in case they did something. People seeing this as Palpatine's greatest failure, and maybe his plans weren't benefiting the Republic, rather taking away from the success they could have with more diplomatic politicians. Anakin and Mira stuck close to Padme throughout these hearings, to which Anakin would break down the Republic and explain everything to Mira in a way that she would be able to understand. On Genosis, the fun had already begun. The four Jedi were able to sneak onto the planet, but they immediately realized that they were building a war machine and needed to stop it here and now. Windu, Voss, Tin, and Koth all came together to create a plan. The Jedi came together. Windu informed his fellow Jedi that he would separate Dooku from the Council while they captured the Council. They would have to be careful though. The Genosians were clearly in on it and there were millions if not billions of droids here in Genosis. Windu would sneak around without his posse as the other three Jedi cornered the Separatist Council inside of their meeting room, cutting off all the communications from the rest of the facility, while also locking all the doors. Windu on the other hand was confronted by Dooku. Count Dooku knew his old friend was there, and so he pulled himself around and waited for Mace. When Windu came around the corner, Dooku didn't take time for pleasantries. With someone like Obi-Wan, he could have possibly convinced him, having been taught by Qui-Gon, but Windu wouldn't play that game. Mace saw the threat immediately and ignited his lightsaber. This was going to be a duel to end the conflict. Mace understood his responsibility in the moment. He knew Dooku really well. Dooku was an incredible duelist, but Mace had to be better. Windu didn't pander towards conversation, he waited for Dooku to make the first move. Dooku knew better than to make the first move, so he waited. It was kind of ridiculous, a little standoff. 
Windu and Dooku walked around each other, pacing, keeping their blades forward, tapping against each other before Windu pushed into his assault. Dooku parried and struck back, throwing his blade forward. Windu and Dooku then threw their blades against each other in a powerful fury of talent. Windu led his precision and his powers in Vapad to take advantage of Dooku's reliance on the dark side. Unlike his battle against Yaddle, Windu was already ready to capitalize off of Dooku's weaknesses. Their blades crushed through the walls, dislocating support beams. Windu threw himself forward, using both his physical strength and his strength of the force to keep Dooku off balance. Their duel was fierce, and it lasted for a good while before Windu decided to take the final blow to his former friend, still not knowing that Dooku was the one to kill Yaddle. Windu was able to break Dooku's defense, killing him in the process. Windu would find his way around the chamber of the Separatist Council and get in. The Jedi would make contact with the Republic and inform them of what they had discovered in Genosis. This would be revealed after the Republic voted against the Military Creation Act. It would also be, thanks to Anakin and Amira, broadcasted in front of the entire Senate. Through this reveal, the Republic would be firstly outraged, but in an effort to avoid all-out war, the Republic would have calls for the beginning of talks with the Separatists. Palpatine would be completely caught off guard, and he would call for a recess from the Senate and inform the Senate that he would get into contact with the Jedi and discuss the situation before the Republic did anything outrageous. The Senate would be noticeably distraught. They are outraged that Palpatine would call for a recess in the middle of an important information dump. All the information just revealed would be very integral to the future of the galaxy. If the Chancellor was willing to hide the information from the rest of the Senate, then what else was he hiding? Politically, it was a poor decision for Palpatine to make on a whim. He could have made a number of better choices, but he chose wrong. The Senate would continue to wait until Palpatine returned. He would inform the Senate of what he discovered when he returned, revealing that the Jedi went to Genosis to find out why people were trying to assassinate Senator Amidala. Palpatine admitted that the Jedi did so without his knowledge, trying to throw the Jedi under the sandcrawler, but as he continued, the Senate got rowdier. Palpatine told the Senate that the Republic did not negotiate with assassins nor revolutionists. There were those who sided with him on that notion, but the wider group of the Senate disagreed. They believed that firstly, if people were deciding to start a revolution against the Republic, then there had to be a reason why. Not that there was something wrong with the Republic, rather its leadership. Palpatine had an odd timing for coming into power during the Separatist invasion of Naboo, or should I just say, Trade Federation. So if the Senate were to avoid the word coincidence, then it was extremely plausible that Palpatine wasn't able to correct the failures of Valorum. The Senate, while waiting for Palpatine to return, would vote a no-confidence impeachment for the Chancellor, immediately removing him from office. When he did eventually return to the Senate, it would completely catch him in shock, but he was instantly outed from office. As the Republic called it, an important decision for the balance of the galaxy. With war on the hands of everyone inside the Senate chamber, the impeachment was necessary. Because of this quick action, the heroics of the Jedi, they would be able to stop a galaxy-wide war. With Yoda finding the clone army and the Separatists rescinding their approach to war, it was a very tense galactic atmosphere, but it was enough to stop a war from happening. Because of this creation of the clone army and the lack of the clone wars, the Jedi would begin an investigation into the creation of the clone army. It would take a simple threatening of no payment to the Kaminoans to get them to talk, saying that their army was constructed because of Tyrannus. It would take some time in putting the pieces together, but the Jedi would come to discover how everything came to happen after taking a trip to the Pike homeworld of Scipio. Palpatine would completely disappear from the spotlight as his plans for galactic war fell through. Two decades would pass without the sight of the Sith. The silence would certainly be eerie. The Jedi would spend their time searching for the Sith to no avail. Grandmaster Yoda had passed away of a natural death during this time. Mira had become the lead temple guard, and the Chosen One had trained two other students whilst becoming the Master of the Order. Mace Windu took the position of Grand Master. While he wasn't the eldest in the Order, he was suggested to take that role from the Jedi Council. The galaxy had seen a radical change, and without Palpatine, the galaxy was able to swiftly avoid war, and they were working back towards a time of peace. The Republic took the clone troopers and let them fit in with society, removing their inhibitor chips so that they couldn't become a threat to the people of the galaxy. It certainly took time for the clones to adjust, but it was better than just killing them off like they were not living people. For Sidious, he reverted to training Maul again, having found his former students surviving on a trash world, hardly alive. 
Maul really wasn't much of a threat to Sidious or to the Jedi, and since his grand plan was falling apart, the aging Sith Lord was struggling to really get anything back into place. With Anakin on the High Council with his master, the Jedi were doing better than ever. Skywalker was more advanced than any Jedi before him could have ever dreamed of, and he so continuously went out into the galaxy searching for Palpatine. Each of the last 20 years, he continuously searched for him, finding not a trace. On the 20th year, he finally found a trail. It was accidental. Palpatine was trying to set up a coup on a backwater world, and it backfired because he ran into Skywalker. A much older and much more mature man. His face aged with wrinkles, but his hair still hung on the back of his neck, with his robes being fluorescent as ever, and little spots of grey parting his hair. When Anakin saw Palpatine, he didn't even hesitate to ignite his lightsaber. Sidious was completely caught off guard. He didn't even know how to react, because he didn't see Anakin coming. He was pushing his late 80s, even for a Sith Lord that was old, and the dark side began to hurt the owner of who it was possessing. But Maul was present to save his master. Maul clashed with Skywalker, and Sidious replicated the movement by igniting his own lightsabers. Palpatine could run, but it would be much more worth his time if the Sith were able to kill the Jedi's Chosen One. The blades of the Sith clash with Skywalker. The Master of the Order, or the Chosen One as he was, was way more exceptionally talented as he danced around every single strike made by the Sith Lords. Maul was quick even in his old age and his metallic legs, but he fell to pieces as Anakin quickly dragged his blade through his stomach. Sidious, on the other hand, used his blades in an extremely offensive fashion until he too was cut down, without more than three strikes in a row. While the battle that ensued after decades of being in the waiting was relatively short, there was nothing that could stop Anakin. He was the most powerful being in the galaxy, and he was fully balanced, trained by the best to be the best. Anakin would rid the galaxy of the Sith, and thankfully to his training, the galaxy would be able to avoid a destructive conflict. Sure, Luke and Leia would never be born, but Anakin Skywalker would finally be able to have the happiness he deserved, and the galaxy protected with his entire being. And that, ladies and gentlemen, is our story. Again, special thanks to Andrew Wells, Jonathan, Pimp Daddy Bane, Icy Raptor, Apollo Mad Matters Dudes, Anakin 003, and Gort for supporting the channel. Hit the links in this video. I don't know what's coming out next, guys. Um, if you want to see it, let me know. We're going to comment, subscribe to Crosshair, check out Twitch, community, support, and Patreon, support me in other ways. For lightsaber, go down below, write your name on the dock. There's a dock down below. You write your name on the dock. Stop fucking with it. I know who's doing it. I can, I know who's. You're not going to win. Simple. You're not going to win. If you fuck with it, you're not going to win. I know who's doing it. I can see your name. Stop it. You little shit. Anyways, let's talk about our story. Um, so first things first. Uh, first of all, I'm I'm in my finals right now. Uh, I'm gonna graduate anytime this week. So sometime this week, I'm gonna be done school forever. Um, so that's kind of what I'm doing. I'm also a music major, so I make music, and my finals are all about making music. So I'm a little bit of a writer's block right now. Uh, this story took me a fucking fortnight to write. I'm not gonna even lie. It took me so long to write. I've had I have had like three or four thumbnails on my on my desktop that have, I've just been looking at and I'm like I don't even know how to write this. So my fair warning to you guys is I'm going through a little bit of writer's block right now um, because between doing the songs and doing the stories, it's a lot of creative output coming out of my mind and my brain is just like whoa, what is going on? Um, so that's my fair warning to you guys if stories don't seem as fantastical as always or you know if they come out slower uh, I always try and put my best foot forward when I make a story so um, I always want to try and put something different something unique out and I, I think I was able to accomplish that with this video so let's talk about this video because that's why I'm going to talk about the video you know um, so first things first uh, let's talk about Mira. Mira is a new character. As I've stated before, I don't like inserting my own characters into the spotlight. Um, I like the idea of having my own characters. Yeah, sure, it's fun to get to add a new dimension, a new character, a new trait, whatever it is, to a story that hasn't been there before. But just like Daisha, just like Natabre, um, and, and multitudes of other characters I've added, Xena, uh, these characters are meant to fit in Star Wars, not supposed to take over Star Wars. I want these characters to exist in Star Wars. So, like, when you're watching the movie, you could be like, oh my gosh, Anakin could have literally just killed Daisha, or could have just killed Mira inside the Jedi Temple. Okay, these characters are expendable, and I'm fine with that. You know, I have no ego. So, putting these characters in there for them to be a part of the universe is a cool idea, but I'm not going to put them into the spotlight. And uh, that's something I've always tried to preach, is... 
while I have no issue putting characters in there and making them even crucial parts of the story, Mira isn't really a crucial part, but she's kind of the second act character. She's a she's a second act um, side character for this part of the story. She's she's what Mace was in the first act of the story, right? So Mira feel, fills a role for Anakin during the second act of the story. And, um, you know, I've had certain characters fill much larger acts, such as uh, Zena. Zena is one of my one of my favorite characters I've ever done. So is Daisha. Um, but these characters are all supposed to fit inside the Star Wars universe. I don't want them to be, you know, spotlight characters. I'm not trying to challenge Anakin. I'm not trying to say, oh, well, I can create a better character than George. If I wanted to do that, I'd write my own story. That, that's that's the truth. I'd write my own universe, whatever it is. I'd write a book about something or whatever. But I'm not trying to do that. I'm using George's work, and I always want to respect George's work, and that's what I always try and do. Um, whilst including stuff from the new canon um, to include everything. Um, so, uh, on top of that, uh, so as you can tell, the difference between this story and the previous story I did is a, is a much different, uh, I believe I'm much better of a writer at this point. And you might see videos that have popped up before that I've done before. I'm not trying to do a kick, quick crash cash grab. What I'm trying to do is I'm just trying to elevate the story that I'd written before. The, the Darth Vader one, for example, I was writing a dark side and a light side, so that was that. Uh, this one, in particular, I had the thumbnail made for it because I was like, I can make a better story than the last one I made. And I believe I did that. I believe I, I definitely did a better story. And I wanted to do something different, you know? Having the Clone Wars not happen was such a different take, and I hope you enjoy that different tone of direction. It got a little political for a second, but without going too deep into politics and, and making the story revolve around that pol political situation um, from Attack of the Clones and just kind of beat around the bush so you guys kind of get the main point of what's going on, uh, I think I think the story is able to uh, heighten itself because of that. And and truth be told, I look, Palpatine and Maul, they're not going to be a threat. After Anakin reaches this level of training for 20, 20 years, they're not going to be a threat. I, I know I can see the comments already. The ending was too short, felt rushed. No, I mean, Anakin is just going to be, he's going to be, he's going to be Starkiller. I don't, Mary Sue, <laughs> whatever you want to call it. He's going to be this unstoppable force. So he's, he's been training for, for 30 years. He's going to be unstoppable. Okay, he'd be unstoppable when Attack of the Clones in this story, essentially, because he was trained by Mace. I mean, at that point, he's going to be just God. He's going to just, he could just break the universe by snapping his finger by accident, just like walking down the street and going, oh, I want to snap my fingers, and then the galaxy's gone. So, like, you know, the, the fun part of this is, 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 is kind of, like, how far can you go with Anakin? And him killing Palpatine and Maul, who were both really accomplished duelists, really accomplished force users in a short period of time, is really what I can do to encapsulate that feeling, that to show that off. Um, but other than that, I really hope you enjoyed this. Um, again, sorry for the lack of uploads. It's final season. Uh, I know all of all my uh, fellow collegiate members and even high schoolers are going through that. So, uh, best of luck to all you, my friends, um, in your finals. Got a great lineup coming out for uh, for Christmas break, so I hope you all are excited. Uh, hopefully my writer's block will be gone by then. Otherwise, I love you all. Spread the love, and always remember, my friends, may the Force be with you.